First off, I want to say thank you so much for all of, the, all of you who have signed up so far for Operation Chesterfield. We have massive amounts of people who have signed up for canvassing, have signed up to work our block party. It has been awesome. If you haven't signed up yet, there is still time to do so. You can find a sign-up sheet in the back or in your Sunday school classes. And the more the merrier. We need as much help as we can get if we're going to serve this community. So please keep that in mind and please sign up. Thank you guys for coming to Kingsland. We are so thankful if you are a visitor that you've chosen to come here and check us out this morning. And if you wouldn't mind, inside your bulletin you'll find a visitor card. Could you just take a second and fill that out so we can get to know you a little bit better, how we can be praying for you, and just a little more about who is knowing our church. Let's pray, and we will continue in worship. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we can come into your presence and we can worship you. We can lift up your name. I pray that we would do that today, that we would be encouraged and challenged through your word today. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's continue to worship. My hope is built on nothing less. Here we go. My hope is built.
Come lift up holy hands because you are the, are the only one worthy to lift up holy hands to. You are the God Almighty, Father, the God of creation. And we thank you, Father, for who you are. We come loving you, Father, for who you are. Praise you, Father, for who you are. And worshiping you, Father, for who you are. Father, we come this morning just uh, because you have blessed us so much, Father, we want to return that blessing to you that you may be able to use it to abroad to bless others. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are the change the world is waiting for we've got a Religious, but I'm not really a church going person, so I really couldn't tell. The church, yeah. it's like a group of people that get together to worship God. Church first is not the building, church is actually within us. Um, so, church to me is a place not only the building but within us, but we can go and receive. Uh, healing, receive deliverance um, through Christ. Smaller communities and so forth. Yes, I do believe that. I mean, I believe they're able to reach people. Yeah. yeah. 
people from the church actually go out and talk to people about it. They don't just say, oh, come to church. They actually they have ministers come door to door and talk about it. Um, I believe it does. Um, people in the church, they influence each other for the same beliefs, uh, stand up for the same thing. So I do believe that together, as a unit, they do have some power. And um, do you think the church has any power today? It does, but it doesn't. I don't think church has the power that it should and can have. Um, if we were to embrace the word of the Apostle Paul, where he tells us, what well, Christ actually tells us, we are one body. And if we come together as one body, we can be that, we can wake up that sleeping giant that we are. We will go where you tell us to go. We will speak out your very word. We will move when you tell us to move. That video is a reminder of how people in our community feel about church. Our youth went to Evangelism Conference here recently. That's a lot of, those video, a lot of the scenes from Evangelism Conference where they were inspired, first of all, to give their hearts to Jesus, but then to take that message back home. And that's where a lot of that video came from. And from people, that's your community, that's people in our community, how they feel about church. Really, a question you need to ask yourself is, why in the world are you here today? Why did you get up and come to church when you could have been home watching golf or over eating a hamburger somewhere, a chicken burger or something, sausage nugget, I don't know. Why would you, why would you spend three hours of your day? A lot of you went to Bible study. Why would you do that? Why would you come in here? Have you ever thought about um, some of our, our so one of our, our folks who was, was working out around the church today, this week, um, said, they noticed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches, cars driving by our church. Why on earth would they want to come in here? How do they view us? Well, we just got a firsthand look at how some of them view us. And sometimes Christians give God a bad name, right? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do good, right? I'm so thankful for all those that have signed up for Operation Chesterfield so far. I hope more of you will. Um, the, the blessing's all yours. It's like tithing. Man, the blessing's all yours. When you give of yourself the blessing, you're going to be blessed so much more. And um, in April, we will focus outward. We focus outward all year long. But in April, we're really going to get all over it. If you're physically able, you can join a, a, a canvassing team. Just pass out flyers. That's it. That's what we're doing that first Sunday. If you're not physically able, um, you, can, you can join the, the, the prayer team. Or if you prefer to join the prayer team, there'll be a prayer team that's holding us up the whole time we're out there. In fact, we're going to pray right now for Operation Chesterfield. I want you to pray with me. Just remember that second Sunday, we're going to throw the red carpet out to our community. At 1030 on Easter morning, we'll have our Easter services in the Family Life Center. The day before, we'll have our block party. We're expecting a whole lot of people. If these 30 canvassing teams or more, it might end up being more canvassing teams, invite thousands of folks. We're sending out a mailer inviting thousands of of folks to come at a off-campus event at Ironbridge Sports Park the day before Easter for that big Easter egg hunt and all the games and the fun and the candy and all that. But that's just really a way to get into people's lives because we want to invite them to come here to worship with us. The Sunday after Easter and the Sunday after that, those same teams that go out canvassing on that first Sunday will go out following up, hopefully on 100 200 visits of folks that don't have a church that we will go back and try to get them to come to our church. That's the game plan. That's what we're doing. Would you pray with me about it? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Last week I challenged you to fast and to pray. The Word of God challenged us to fast and to pray. 
I heard somebody behind me tell me how hungry they are. So somebody's fasting right now, just getting through the service. It's not going to be short. <laughs> so get ready. I have a burden on my heart to share with you this morning, church, and I want you to hear it. I want you to hear what the Word of God has to say for your life. But right now, let's all of us focus on Operation Chesterfield. Would you do that? Would you pray that God will bless our efforts to take the gospel all over this community? Please join with me as I do that. Agree with me. Take your, your, your petitions to the Lord right now with me. Oh, God, please help us to successfully reach people in our community, to effectively reach people in Chesterfield County with the gospel. Lord God, I pray that you would motivate us, mobilize us, empower us, use us in ways that we've never been used before, each one of us. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the souls that came to Christ last week, in the week before, in the week before. Lord, I pray that you would help everyone who's given their heart to Christ to get plugged into church and to get baptized. And to, and, to, and to grow in their faith. But Lord, today we realize that there is a community and a world that is lost and dying and that we are the ones you've commissioned to take great risks, to make tremendous inconveniences and, 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 and to make tremendous sacrifices to take the gospel to that world. And Lord, we know that the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home and we want to be red hot. We want to be on fire for you. So Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would descend on us right now, light that fire in us, so that we will be motivated, that we will be compelled by the love of Christ to take the gospel into difficult places, inconvenient places, faithfully for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn over to Acts chapter 13, and it'll be a minute before we get there, but we got a lot of verses to read. Um, this is one of the few times I'll tell you we might be here a while, so just get comfortable. Um, it, it, it's going to be good, I promise you. Just hang in there. I'm going to read through this text in a minute, and we're just going to kind of talk about it as we go through it. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Have you noticed that children love adventure? Children love adventure. They love Superman. And my boys are reading, my son's reading the Hardy Boys. Anybody ever read the Hardy Boys novels? Man, those are cool the Hardy Boys and the Chronicles of Narnia, and they love to run and jump and dig holes. I, I was cutting the grass yesterday. I looked in the back. We have a back backyard that we call it, and my son has built, dug a hole that you could fit a body in. And I'm like, whoa, man, who asked permission for that? We need to, we need to do something about that. Um, and, and they are adventurous, right? We need to fan the flame of adventure in our kids. In fact, we need it to get, Remember Jesus said it's, you know, the faith of a child, how about the, doesn't that extend into the adventurousness, the spirit of a childlike faith that says, man, I'm just going to go for it. Well, I, mean, I love coaching children. The younger, the better. Because they will do whatever you say. I mean, you could say, walk like a crab across the court and back. And they're going to walk like a crab across the court and they're going to come back. We need to fan that flame, don't we? We need more of that. And in Acts chapter 13, Paul is on an adventure. Luke is writing about it. Barnabas is with them. John, uh, John is about to fly the coop. He's about to quit. But they're on a, a road trip, okay, from Cyprus over to modern-day Turkey. I hope the day that maybe we'll just start getting that fan flamed a little bit, that some of us have put, got a few miles on our tires. We'll realize, man, we don't need to pace ourselves. Quit pacing yourself. Just go for it. That's my problem with basketball. I've been pacing myself too long. And my wife yells at me, you need to run. You're not even running. You're walking fast. That doesn't count. If, if there's not both feet off the ground, that's not running. <laughs> I took my son, to, um, my, my little boy David, to, to, out to eat at a buffet the other day. And um, Elizabeth was out of town. Um, John was somewhere else, and it was just me and David. And, man, we were just going at it at the buffet. I won't say where, but uh, it doesn't matter. But, but I got a plate, he got a plate, and I was like, hey, David, why don't you just go sit at the table? I'll get all your food and, and bring it to you. I never have to do that normally, but it was just me and David. I got to do everything, everything. And um, so anyway, he runs over to the table, and I, but I, it was a busy restaurant. And I, I'm, like, walking behind him. Just make sure he gets there. He doesn't sit down. It's just a table for two, me and David, having a Daddy David date. He doesn't sit down. He crouches behind the chair, 
and he doesn't have anything in his hand except his can. Those of you that don't give your kids guns, God bless you. Doesn't matter. They're going to make a gun out of their hand. We got guns everywhere at our house. And he starts going, do, 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 I'm like, and he's not even really pointing at anybody in particular. I don't think anybody was offended, except the no guns people. He was in his own mind. A voyage. They're all into that, right? Man, we need, we need more of that. I want more of that. I think we need more of that. And when we see the sacrifices that the Apostle Paul makes in Acts chapter 13, it is, it is a serious, serious sacrifice he makes. He and Barnabas. And what we see is that they love Jesus so much. They were so passionate about God that they, they were willing to risk everything. They were willing to risk everything for the cause of the gospel. In Cyprus, because they leave Cyprus, they go to Perga, they go back to the mainland, and John Mark leaves. He's done. We'll talk about more about that when we read the text. So now it's just Paul and Barnabas and, and, and I guess Luke, who is, we think is writing all this stuff down. And they're going to go 100 miles north into the Taurus Mountains to get to Antioch, Antioch of Pisidia. And Paul and Barnabas model here an extreme approach to missions, to say the least, risking everything so that Jews and Gentiles can be saved. Now think about the fire truck. Fire truck. I love fire truck. My kids love fire truck. Or the ambulance. When it goes by, what do you, what do you think? What do you, man, they're going to rescue somebody. They're going to save somebody's life. They are heroes. I'm going to Africa in April with a firefighter, a retired firefighter named Pete Hypes. I love Pastor Pete because I know if anything happens to me, he can at least resuscitate me and give me the best medical care possible out there in the middle of Africa. But one thing I love about him and admire about him is a firefighter. That means they put on those, those fireproof suits and they bust into the house and it's on fire and stuff's falling out and they risk their lives. They take tremendous, tremendous risks. They make tremendous sacrifices. Their family makes tremendous sacrifices for them to get to, to save lives. How much more, how much less dedicated should we be to them? We should be more dedicated to them. Those who follow Jesus should be as dedicated to reaching lost people as he was. That's us. If you say you're a follower of Christ, don't tell me you're a Christian or a follower of Christ if you're unwilling to make any sacrifices whatsoever or if you fight, why are they passing the offering plate again? Those people, all they want is your money. Really? No. Or, or why are they going out there again? What do we get out of it? No. Man, we're, we, wanna, we want to serve the king as smart as possible, as creatively as possible, using, using the brains that he's given us, not wasting our time, not wasting our resources. We should be willing and we should be as dedicated as Jesus was to reach people. How dedicated was he? He gave it all, didn't he? He gave up every, everything. And in this text, as New Testament Christians, we are all called to minister. Who is the minister at Kinsland? Pat Fjordelis? Derek Barnett? You better believe it. And put there too. You are the minister at Kingsland. We are all missionaries. What's a missionary? Someone who has been called, someone who is on mission, people on mission for God. How about that? We're all missionaries. Be a missionary. The only question is where, really. I minister one place, you minister somewhere else, you go places I could never go. Listen to me. They might, but they might not. They might not listen to you either. But you have a better chance, don't you? God expects us to take great risks, and make tremendous sacrifices to share the gospel. Some will accept the good news, some will reject it, others will love you, others will hate you, whatever. I had an opportunity, I tried to take an opportunity to share the gospel with a guy this week, older fella. He couldn't care less, all he wanted was to be done with me. And he was, it, was very, it wasn't a very long conversation. I tried. Now I could spend the rest of the week whining about it or go, maybe someone else will get him. I'm going to go find someone else. We do not rely on our techniques, our fancy methodology or anything like that to reach people. We know that salvation comes from the Holy Spirit, God drawing people to himself. We'll see that in this text. But we are to um, faithfully communicate the Our concern is to communicate the good news and leave the results in God's hands. That's kind of, that's kind of nice, isn't it? That we don't have to feel like the fate of the world is in your hands. <laughs> Let God be God. You take a break from that, okay? Our job, our concern is to faithfully, creatively, clearly, accurately communicate 
the good news and leave the results in God's hands. Now, th that sounds like it would be easy, but it's not. How many churches completely muddy the waters and make it as complicated as possible? I don't know why they do that. Don't complicate it. There's whole religious systems s seemingly based to complicate the gospel. How about creatively? Should we take the word of God and make it as boring and dull and, and, and just lifeless as possible? No way, man. Of course not. The word of God is powerful and quick, more sharper than a two-edged sword. When you come to church, man, you should worship the Lord and you should be inspired and excited and shout to God with the voice of triumph. How about clearly? How about accurately? Our concern is to faithfully, creatively, clearly, accurately communicate the word of God and leave the result in God's hands. There are millions of people today who are waiting to hear the gospel. The vast majority of them don't even know it. They don't even realize they're lost, but they are. And God is ready and willing to save them for the asking. Sadly, hear this, many Christians are so consumed with their own temporary problems. Does anybody in here not have problems? J-Lo evidently doesn't have a care in this world. I didn't understand that. Um, because she said, I don't have a care in this world. I don't understand why she would say that. I know she's got problems. So if you're the guy or the person that doesn't have any problems, no cares in this world, this isn't for you, okay? All of us have problems. We all have problems. But as Christians, sometimes we're so consumed with our own temporary problems and our own personal happiness and our own concerns that we rarely stop to consider the masses who are lost who do not have Jesus. We're addicted to comfort safety stability safeness we think we're safe we have the air temperature set just right for some of us the rest of you think it's too hot too cold i know i'm with you but we think we're safe because we have an airbag i guess or because we have locks on our doors or because we live in america man just read the news we're not safe Iran gets nuclear weapons and everything changes our whole stability as we know it could completely change you think gas is expensive now we're not safe. It's a facade. It's artificial. We have ourselves like, it's almost like being in the car with the radio on, the temperature just right, and, and you're just driving down the road and everything's great, but you're going the wrong way on the highway and you're about to run head on into a Mack truck. You're not safe. I believe that's America right now. And we need a religious revolt. We need a holy revolt. We need to stop. We need to knock it off. You know, 18 years ago, I got to spend time with a man named Sam. Sam Fry. He's the leader of Open Air evangelism ministries in new york city this guy takes groups of people from the bible institute i was at word of life bible institute at the time and we would go down they'd take a dozen of us or 20 of us and we were on the streets of new york city and preach the gospel i loved it it was it was an amazing experience i mean every everything you could think of weird that would happen happened and a lot of people got saved that week i left i've never been back to do that i've been back to new york city once or twice but i've never been back to do that sam fry will be there tomorrow morning just like he has for the last 20 years. He's probably in his late 50s, maybe his 60s now. He is as burdened for the lost as Jesus was. He is faithfully in the cold, in the heat, when it's convenient, when it's not, and it never is. Let's just say that. It's never convenient. He's faithfully doing this thing. Still, after all these years, there is no real safety. There is no security. What we read in Acts chapter 13 is the gospel according to Paul. So let's read it. I will um, ask you to bear with me. This is a long passage. So what I'm going to do is read it and make commentary as we go. I don't normally do that. I like to read it, come back to it, and analyze it. Today, let's just read it. We'll read it together, and I'll provide a little commentary as we go. Okay? Verse 13 is where, we're, where we left off at verse 12 last week. We'll start in verse 13. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John, however, left them and went back to Jerusalem. John Mark, he departs before they start out on their long journey up into the mountains to Antioch, Pisidia. Now, those of you who are keeping notes, remember they started Antioch. Now they're back at Antioch. How's that happen? Well, there were 16 Antiochs in that day. A guy by the name of Seleucius Nicator was a tremendous general warrior, and when he conquered cities, he named them after his father, who was Antiochus, and after his son, who was Antiochus. So you have 16 of these cities. This is Antioch, Pisidia. John 
leaves. They don't know if it was because he was homesick. Maybe he was weary from travel. Uh, maybe he was sick with malaria or something. Or there was something not right with him and Paul. Unhappy with Paul, the new team leader. Remember, it started at the beginning of the chapter, Saul and Bar- or Barnabas and Saul, and now it's Paul and Barnabas. He's using his Greek name, Paul. He's the leader. He's taking the gospel directly to the Gentiles with no Jewish legal requirements. We saw that from Sergius Paulus, who was saved the week before without becoming a proselyte, without becoming a Jew. He went from being a Gentile to being saved as a born-again Christian, which they will use the word Christian here soon. That's a big deal. It's possible John Mark didn't like that. In fact, there was a whole council at Jerusalem. How do we know that that all didn't get back to Jerusalem via John Mark? We don't know. But can you imagine the discouragement that Luke and Paul, Barnabas, and, and the team, and John was, was kind of like a deacon. He was a, a servant. He, he did a lot of the, the, the footwork. He did a lot of the heavy lifting. He did a lot of the behind-the-scenes work, and, 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 and they lost him. Isn't it discouraging? We, I mean, if you've lost somebody, you know how discouraging that is. Maybe someone from your Sunday school class or a, 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 your spouse leaves you, a child, a friend, whatever. They were discouraged, I'm sure, by this experience. And we know that it, it didn't, it did, it, it, the, the wound kind of festered there because Paul didn't want John Mark back on the team for the next trip. Okay, verse 14. They start off by reaching the Jews in the synagogue. Are you there? They continued their journey from Perga and reached Antioch and Pisidia on the Sabbath day. They went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have any message of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Then standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and spoke. And he said, Men of Israel, and you here fear God, listen. I like that. Listen. It reminds me of Charles Stanley. Have you ever noticed Charles Stanley? Listen, listen, listen. Maybe you learned that from the Apostle Paul. Listen, I'm about to say something very important. Maybe, you know, Paul was a Pharisee. Do you remember back to him being a Pharisee? Maybe he, was, he wore his pharisaical robes. For some reason, they invite him to speak. This is one of three sermons that Paul gives in the book of Acts. He provides a survey of Israel's history. Now, can you remember anybody else who provided a survey of Israel's history? Stephen, a more in-depth survey of Israel's history. Before Saul, Paul, then Saul, had him killed. So, man, the shoe's on the other foot now. Look at verse 17. This is a quick survey of the history of Israel. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers, our forefathers, exalted the people during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out with a mighty arm. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the desert. Then, after destroying the nations in the land of Canaan, he met their land. He gave their land to them as an inheritance. This all took her up about 450 years. After this, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After removing him, he raised up David as their king, of whom he testified, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who would carry out all my will. Now, he's specifically mentioning David. He specifically mentions that God rose up David. Remember, David was the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. David was the one they expected to sit on the throne forever. They had no idea, how does David sit on the throne forever? In their their Jewish minds, they must have thought, man, that doesn't make any sense. He's dead. And Solomon and um, Rehoboam and and, and the the kingly line, there wasn't even one of of David's ancestors. The, The kingdom was split. Well, he's about to explain to them, he's about to give them some real... This is big. For this man's descendants, according to the promise, promise, God, God brought the Savior, Jesus, to Israel. Now, I'm pretty sure everything in the synagogue got quiet at that point. He's lucky they didn't pick up rocks and throw them at him. He had their attention. He's saying something very, very important now. Verse 24. Before he came to public attention, John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Then, as John was completing his work, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not the one, but look, someone who's coming after me, and I'm not worthy to untie the sandals of his feet. Maybe some of these folks had heard of John, the baptizer. Maybe some of them heard of Jesus. 
This is the gospel according to Paul. And when we read these verses, look out for the word justification. He's going to exhort them to believe. He's going to quote the prophet Habakkuk. And he's going to instigate them to make an important decision. Okay, verse 27. For the residents of, of Jerusalem and their rulers, since they did not recognize him or the voices of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Though they found no grounds for the death penalty, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had fulfilled all that had been written about him, they took him down from the, from the tree and put him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. Man, that, that's a very short verse, but boy, that's saying a lot, isn't it? That's the resurrection. That's, this is the gospel, according to Paul. Jesus Christ lived, died, was buried, and on, in verse 30, he raised him from the dead. And he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our forefathers. God has fulfilled to this, to us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. And that's important. Jesus, or God, had a son. Did they have any, any mental thought for God, Jehovah, having a son? Well, he reminds them that the psalmist told him that God did. In verse 34, since he raised him from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will grant you the faithful covenant blessings made to David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not allow your holy one to see decay. Again, David, the king, the, the, the one they look back to, is in the ground and, and gone. Those promises, he's explained to them, they're going to be fulfilled, they were fulfilled through Jesus. For David, after serving his generation in God's plan, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and decayed. But the one whom God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. And everyone who believes in him is justified. Justified. That means to be declared righteous. Just as if I'd never sinned, that's the getting rid of the negative, as if I'd never sinned, and then on the positive, to be declared righteous, justified. That's a powerful word there from everything. And it says, which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. He's talking to the Jews. He's talking about people who were under the law, the old covenant. You could not be justified. You cannot be declared righteous. You cannot be saved by obeying the Old Testament law. They couldn't, and guess what? You can't. None of us can. Everyone under the sound of my voice, listen. <laughs> Just like he said, listen, God loves you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He was buried. He rose from the grave. He shed his blood to cover your sins, to justify you. The righteous requirements had to be paid. God's wrath on sin had to be unleashed, and it was unleashed on Jesus Christ, his son, the only one, the only human God, God, man, that could handle it. That was so that we could be justified. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ lived perfect life, died on the cross, was buried, rose from the grave. And everyone who believes in him is justified from everything, which you could not be justified from the law of Moses. That means trying to be good, going to church, giving money to the poor, being a nice person, paying your taxes. None of it is going to save you. None of it. Only Christ's blood will save you. So beware what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. Okay, that's, that's big stuff. They're like, whoa, wow, this guy's serious. And they invite him back for the next Sabbath. But large crowds of Gentiles show up, infuriating the self-righteous religious leaders who turn on Paul. Look at verse 42. As they were leaving, they begged that these matters be presented to them the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and persuading them to continue the grace of God. The following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the message of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to oppose what Paul was saying by insulting him. 
They invited him back, and when he came back, lots of Jews, lots of proselytes, that's non-Jews who became Jews to follow Jehovah God, and lots of God-fearing Gentiles who were not yet proselytes, but were considering that, and lots of just dirty, cruddy, low-life, trashy Gentiles showed up. And the religious leaders could not tolerate it. They absolutely couldn't accept that those people would come to their sanctuary. How dare they? They're dirty. They're unclean. We want nothing to do with them. Now, here's the application. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be someone who is religious but spiritually dead. I mean, these people were as lost as geese, and they're judging the Gentiles for showing up in mass. They didn't. Do you realize there's people that would rather a large crowd not come to church? There are churches that are small, and they think, well, we're small because we love each other and we, we are, are holy and everybody else is not. And you know what? There's some really good small churches and there's some really good big churches, okay? There's some really bad small churches, some really bad big churches. But here's the point. If someone bothered to show up, they would not feel welcome because they're not in the crowd. One of them. They'd be looked at funny. They wouldn't be accepted. They wouldn't be warmly greeted. May that never be said of Kingsland Baptist Church. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't want be one who is religious but spiritually dead. And every time we try to change anything, the, the, the guilt is on the change. The, the assumption is that's bad. It could be a good change, but it's bad because it's change. It doesn't make every change good. Some changes are bad, and those should be rejected. But when you're suspicious of everything, and when you're critical of everything, everything, and you're known for being that, a critical person, I mean, that's a bad way to be. You're on, you're on your way to being a Pharisee. Don't be that. And in verse 46 and verse 47, we see that Paul always started with the Jews. And as we read through the, the New Testament, we see that. But he explains that God had prearranged for the Gentiles to receive the gospel after the Jews rejected it. And he quotes Isaiah from Isaiah 42. Look at verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas boldly said, it was, it was necessary that God's message be spoken to you first at the synagogue, but since you reject it and consider yourselves unworthy of, of, of eternal life, now we turn to the Gentiles. Man, that's a, that's a you, have, you have considered yourself unworthy of eternal life. Could that be somebody under the sound of my voice right now? You've considered yourself unworthy of eternal life. Yeah, you go to church, or yeah, you've got a, a great bank account, or yeah, you take real good care of your family, or yeah, you're an upstanding, proud citizen in our community, but you're lost. And you're unwilling to humble yourself like a child and have the faith of a child and to receive Christ as Savior. That's the situation these people were in. In verse 47, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's Isaiah. He's referring back to the Old Testament. They, they, they certainly would have realized that. Isaiah said that they would take the gospel all over the world to the Gentiles. He's one of our prophets. Habakkuk said, don't you be hard-headed. Don't you be stubborn. They should have got it, but they didn't. They let their pride get in the way. They let their pride get in the way of, of doing what God wanted them to do. Of course, when, when, remember when, when Saul was converted on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, I will show you what great things you will suffer. You will be my light to the Gentiles. He always started with the Jews, but he always ended up with the Gentiles. And then verse 48, man, this one's fun. Verse 48, put a circle around it. It's controversial. Let's go. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and glorified the message of the Lord. Now, that's, that's not controversial. That's just good stuff. Get saved. Receive it. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, receive it today. Give your heart to Jesus. Receive his free gift of salvation. Receive justification, which means I'm not good enough, but Jesus is, and he lives in my life, and he's made me good enough. He's made me holy and pure and righteous. Receive it, and then share it. But the verse goes on to say this. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, some of you think, well, what's, con what's controversial about that? That doesn't, doesn't strike you as controversial. All who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Here we have the cosmic battle between God's sovereignty and the free will of man. This is one of the strongest texts in all of Scripture defining God's sovereign election. Along with Ephesians 1, 4, you can write that down and read it later. 1 Peter 1, 2, and even in the book of Acts 2, 39. Ephesians 1.4, 1, 1 Peter 1, 1.2, and Acts 2.39. I like what um, James Prohill, Brohill, who is a professor at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, said about this verse. In this phrase, we encounter the same balance between human volition 
and divine providence that is found throughout Acts. The Gentiles took an active role in believing, but it was in response to God's Spirit moving. So God is sovereign. Mankind does have a choice. You have a choice today. If you're lost, you have a choice whether or not to receive Christ as Savior. You can reject it. You can accept it. The, most of the Jews in the synagogue rejected it. Many of the Gentiles received it. Every one of them were appointed from God to receive it, according to this text. And to bring in some balance, let's remember, God is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 5, 9. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's you. I shared that verse two minutes before our service started with somebody. Because I believe it. I can remember when I, when I called on the name of the Lord and I was lost. He came in and saved me. You may be a child, you may be an adult, you may be a senior adult. Call upon the name of the Lord, he'll save you. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, he'll save. And whosoever will may come. 1 Timothy 2.3, write down 1 Timothy 2.3. God desires all men to be saved. So that's where God stands on it. He told us where he stands on it. He's not willing that any should perish. He desires that all men should be saved. It's a divine mystery trying to understand God's sovereignty and man's free will. In verse 50, it goes on to say this. But the Jews incited the religious women of high standing and the leading men of the city. Why is it that women get such a bad rap on things like this? The Jews incited the religious women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their, de their, their district. But shaking the dust off their feet against them, they proceeded on to Iconium. They just kept right on going. The Jewish leaders convinced the local leaders to expel Paul and Barnabas from their, their region. And when they're expelled, they follow the example of Jesus. Jesus said, when, you're, when, you're, when one place doesn't accept, one village doesn't accept, shake the dust off your shoes and keep right on going. That's what we need to do. Some of us like to roll around in the dust and go, oh, they were mean to me. Did you hear what he said to me? He called me a fanatic. Don't roll around in the dust and, and get all depressed. Just move on. You don't have to go to Iconium. For you, it might just be going to the next house down the street. Talk to somebody else about Jesus. And when they shook the dust off their feet, it's very interesting. They would have felt the symbolism on that. The, the, the Jews in that day, if they had to walk through Gentile territory, when they got out of it, back to the Holy Land, they would take their sandals off and knock off all that nasty Gentile sand. They didn't want all that worldly Gentile sand getting on their feet. And then they would step back into the Holy Land. So you have kind of a good thing there. You have separation from just jumping into the world and being worldly and being full of sin. But you also have the concept of we're going to hide over here. We're holy. We're better than them. We don't want anything to do with them. We're going to live in our own little world sheltered away from it. Do you see that? Don't do that. They shook the, shook the dust off, kept right on going. In verse 52, we see this. Persecution, difficulty, suffering, opposition, whatever word you want to use, results in solidarity and enjoy the last verse there verse 52 and the disciples were filled with joy in the holy spirit they were rejected they were treated badly and they were filled with joy i want to make two points of application from this text and then we're going to give you an invitation if you need to get saved give your heart to jesus if you need to get moving if you need to get more serious about your faith today's the day to do it i've spent a lot of time praying for this mowing my grass yesterday praying for this moment right now and I'm going to ask everybody that's been in and out and in and out and in and out to sit down and stay still for just a minute, unless you have an emergency. Then everybody's going to be looking at you and go, oh, man, he's got an emergency. But that's okay. We won't think bad of you. We all have emergencies sometimes. But please sit still and listen. I'm just asking for a few more minutes of your time. Here is the action items I want to give you and then challenge you and, and exhort you today to walk out of here with. Are you ready? Here's number one. Here's what I see from this text. If you wrap it all up into one statement, here it is. Go farther and give more than you ever dreamed for Christ's sake. Go farther and give more than you ever dreamed for the sake of your Savior who, get, who went all the way and, did, and gave everything for you. What am I talking about? More of your time, more of your money, more of your energy, more of your plans, more of yourself, more of your freedom. Because we love freedom. We want to do what we want to do. We don't get tied down to other things. I was impressed on Friday morning to find out that George Clooney, Hollywood actor, heartthrob, even though he's getting old and crusty, he still act like he's a heartthrob, and his father were arrested 
for refusing to, to remove themselves from the steps of the Sudanese embassy in Washington, D.C. This man is so committed to the people of Sudan getting food that their idiot dictator won't let them get. He, an American, is so concerned for them, he's willing to have his freedom taken from him to be arrested, and his father, who's evidently a famous journalist over there, they were arrested. They gave up their freedom so that people would get food that desperately needed it. How much are you willing to sacrifice? How far are you willing to go? How much more are you willing to give? Heard about a missionary this week whose child was going through, they were, they were going through a village and um, their child was approached by another beggar child who wanted money or whatever and started pulling. They'll pull on you to take whatever you have and you have to kind of say no. And the beggar child took his, took his hand and slapped the child in the face. I don't think he hit him hard, but he slapped him in his face, kind of an insult to, to, to the missionary baby boy. And the mom and dad were frozen. They didn't know what to do. You got to be very careful how you respond to something like that over there. Are you willing to go places where your family is at risk? Go to Voice of the Martyrs. When you get home, go to Voice of the Martyrs and read about Yusef Nadarkani, 34-year-old pastor who's in jail. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. He's been given the death penalty for pulling his kids out of school and saying they shouldn't be forced to be Muslims. Nagan Van Lai in Vietnam. He's a prisoner. Ben Hamin Arani in the Islamic Republic of Iran. He's a prisoner. Mahedi Petros Ferotan is a prisoner. These are real people who are stuck in jail this morning because they stood up for Jesus. Yusef, Yusef Nadakarni, I just mentioned him. Tohar Hadarov in Uzbekistan. Imran Ghaffer in Pakistan. Jean Hamai in China and two others in China. I'm not even going to try to pronounce their names. They're in jail this morning, folks. That's how seriously they take their commitment to Christ. That's how far they were willing to go. And I can see going that far, but I think about my children. I don't want my children to get slapped in the face. I don't want my children to be in danger. I want to hold on to them and keep them safe in good old safe America, where everything's safe and comfortable and stable and secure. No, it's not. It's a facade. We're lying to ourselves if we think that. Go farther and give more than you've ever dreamed for Christ's sake. And I thought about that mowing the grass yesterday, and I thought, ooh, what if God asked me to do that? I don't want to do that. What if God took away that? I don't want to give up that. What if, what if God takes my sermon and comes back and says, do this? And Elizabeth would say, I told you you should do that a long time ago, but I don't want to do that. Let's be specific. I'm asking you to take a step out of your comfort zone. Practically speaking, that might just be smiling at a stranger. That's pretty simple, right? I mean, that, that doesn't seem, for some of you, you're like, that's, anybody can do that. No, some people are, are shy and more insecure and more uh, introverted. And it's hard for them to actually do that. That might be stepping out of your comfort zone. Giving more money than you've ever given before. Thank you to every one of you who gave tithes today and offerings in our church. Maybe God wants more. How about Annie Armstrong, our North American missions focus, which is just a few weeks away. Are you going to be put out when the mission committee comes up and says, we need more, we need more, we're all asking for more. We just quit asking for money a couple weeks ago. Yeah, we know. And we're just going to keep on doing that until Jesus comes. Take a step out of your comfort zone and invite a friend to the Easter block party. Offer to help your neighbor. Get to know your neighbor. Adopt. That's one of the ones I didn't want to include. Don't we have enough children? Well, there's... Lots and lots of children all over our world. There's a thousand foster kids in the city of Richmond that need to be adopted right now. Adopt and give a, a living embodiment of what Jesus Christ, God the Father, did for us. He adopted us into the family. None of you were born into the family. You were born into sin. When you were born again, you were adopted into the family. Sacrifice your energy and your time for someone else. Sign up for the next mission trip. Fast for Operation Chesterfield. Sign up for a canvassing team. Find a, a job at the block party. Give away something valuable to someone who needs it more than you do. Go get a track and give it to somebody. At, at, when you leave a tip, don't ever leave a tip without leaving a track. Why would you do that? It's an opportunity just to tell somebody God loves you and come to Kingsland. Ask God what he wants you to do. I'm quite certain I missed some things that somebody needs to do and God wanted it that way. You fill in the blank. Where is God telling you to go further and to give more? than you've ever dreamed for his sake. We have a dozen ministries in our church. I counted them up. We have about 15 or 16 ministries that we get very little back from. 
We have a dozen or 10 or 11 of them, we get nothing. It is all give, give, give. It's completely give. When we take those buses out, it's about 95% give. Maybe once in a while we'll pick up a Kingsland member or two, but for the vast majority of the time, when we're giving away food and clothes and shelter, it's for people that will never come to church here. We do it because we love Jesus. We do it because they need it, and we want to introduce them to Jesus. And they might end up in another church. That's okay. It's not all about our little kingdom, is it? It's about his kingdom. Go further and give more than you've ever dreamed for the sake of Christ. I saw a man digging through a garbage can the other day, going through the city, and I was with my whole family. There was cars going back and forth. We had done something to help him, but we really couldn't because we were in a hurry to be someplace, and it, it broke my heart. And then we kept going, and there was another man right over there digging through another garbage can. I couldn't believe it. I thought, man, that guy's so hungry, and he's so needy. He's going through garbage cans to find food, money, whatever, something of value. And, and someone's going to go, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't pay attention in fifth grade, or he had a good job, but he gave it up, or, you know, he got hooked on drugs, or... Man, whatever, he's over there eating out of a garbage can. We should have compassion for someone like that and try to do something to help them. Go farther. Give more than you've ever dreamed. And there are people all over our community at work and all over in the nice little neighborhood you live in that are just as, as, as impoverished as that man on the street who's digging through garbage. They are that spiritually hungry. They don't have Jesus. Target them. Pray for them. Minister to them. Reach them. They have a spiritual hunger that only Jesus Christ can feed, and someone needs to be a Paul and a Barnabas, and, and maybe we need to go to Cyprus, maybe we need to float over to modern-day Turkey. I'm willing to do that. Are you willing to do that? Let's do that. But let's start here now. Let's give more than we've ever given for the cause. Remember that whenever you give to Christ, you're going to get back more. That's financial, that's time, that's everything you can think of. When you give to Christ, he's going to give you back more. So just I'm not telling you to do anything that's going to leave you high and dry and broken, busted. And, 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 and how many things have we tried? How many things have we done in our lives that thought, man, if I went to that experience, I'd be happy. If I just had that car, I'd be happy. You've got the car. You've had the experience. You live in the home. And down deep, you're really not that fulfilled. Listen, any time we give to Christ, any time we do things God's, God's way and do it for his kingdom, it is always fulfilling. It's really the only thing that's fulfilling. So the question is this. How far are you willing to go for Jesus? Are you willing to be rejected for Jesus? Are you willing to stop something, start something, give up something? I don't know. It, it, the Holy Spirit will tell you what it is. Are you willing to go anywhere and to give anything? And by the way, when you do, when you come to that point of willingness and start stepping that way, it is so freeing. It is such a faith experience. When you say, you know, I don't really need all that stuff. It's all God's anyway. Man, there's nothing more freeing in the whole world than living that way. In closing, I just want to say this. Never give up. Never give up. Never, ever, 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 ever give up. Never quit. Don't be a quitter. If I've said that to my sons and daughter, thousands, don't quit. Sometimes we resign. Sometimes we move on. Sometimes we try something new. Sometimes we move forward. That's fine. But don't be a quitter. Don't ever quit. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. I would hate to be the guy in the Bible that was known for being the quitter. Poor John. Poor John. Think of Rocky Balboa. Did he ever quit? No. He got punched in the face a thousand times by Mr. T, and he just took it. And I love Mickey in the corner going, he's going to kill you to death, Rock. He's going to kill you to death. And he said, that's okay. Hit me more. It'll tire him out. After he gets done beating in my face, he'll be tired, and then I can knock him right out. That's a mythical character, right? How about Rudy? Rudy was real. I don't really know all the ins and outs of the story. I think the movie was highly embellished. But the point is, the man played for Notre Dame. He was that tall, and, and, and he did it. Go watch the movie or read it in a book or something. It's probably, probably, yeah, read the book. How about Secretariat? That's not even a human. If my mom were here, she would definitely want some time for Secretariat. She's a horse person. They, they sacrificed, they mortgaged everything on Secretariat. They, they didn't know what was going to happen with Secretariat. Triple crown winner. God will do that for you. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't ever give up on your marriage, no matter what. Do not give up. Just don't give up. Don't give up on your call, the dream that God's put in your heart. Don't give up. Just don't give up. Don't give up on your church. Don't give up on God's plan for your life. Don't ever give up on Jesus. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in rising up every time we fail. And thank God, even John, 
although he quit here, he thought better of it later, and he rejoined Barnabas in ministry, and even Paul saw, he won Paul's respect back, because yeah, he quit, but he got back in the game, and that may be you. Maybe some circumstances caused you to quit in the past. Today, you need to reconsider. Dedicate yourself to going farther than you've ever gone, to give more than you've ever given, and to never, ever give up. And if you're tempted to quit, don't. Just don't. I want to go farther than I've ever gone before, and I want to give more than I've ever given, and, and I just wonder, what is it that God needs to remove from my life? What is it that God is wanting to remove from your life? What is God trying to add into your life? But because we're trying to be safe and secure and watching out and being smart and pacing ourselves, we're missing out on God's best. I want you to hear this little poem as we close in prayer. You can bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to hear this in the stillness of the moment. And the band's going to come up and we're going to give an invitation. Don't quit. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is hard with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you can, and, and you can never tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick it out when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not quit. And God, I pray that you would give us, each and every one of us, the boldness and the strength and the wisdom and the courage and the integrity to go further than we've ever gone, to go farther, to give more than we've ever given, to never, ever quit. And for the one who's thinking about quitting, the one who's thinking about giving up, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to, to, to reconsider. So our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and I, and I mean that today. I really want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and even the ones on stage. I, don't want, I want you to stand in an atmosphere of prayer. If you're here and you've got things in your life that are really holding you back, you want to go farther, you want to give more, but, and you want to make that decision, but today you're worried because there's some things that are holding you back. Maybe an addiction, maybe a habit, maybe some... some skeletons in your closet, some things you're struggling with, but in your heart, you desperately want to go farther. And you desperately want to give more for the kingdom of God. And you want me to pray for you right now. I'm your pastor. I love you. I won't come and talk to you. I won't. Nobody's looking, but I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you specifically right now. If that's you, I want to go farther. I want to do more. I want to be more. I want to give more. But to be honest, there's some things that are holding me back that I need to deal with. And I want you to pray for me. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you right now. Raise your hand nice and high so I can see it. Lord God, I pray that you'd move in the hearts of these ones who just want so desperately to give more, to go farther for you than they ever have. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the courage to do it. I pray that you would help them to deal with the things in their lives that need to be dealt with. To repent of sin and to turn their back on addictions and to turn their back on strings that are holding them back, chains that are holding them back besetting them. Lord, help each and every one of us this year, this day, to go farther and to give more than we ever have before, more than we ever dreamed we could. As we continue in a spirit of prayer, I promised I would do this. I promised I would do this. If you want to give your heart to Jesus right now, and what I mean by that is you've come to the end of yourself and you want to repent of your sins, you want to invite Jesus Christ into your life to save you. That means you're admitting you're lost. That means you're admitting you need to be saved. That means you're giving your heart to Christ for all eternity. Nobody else, you can't do this and th some other religion and some other spiritual thing. You're saying, I want to give my heart to Christ right now. You may be young, you may be not young in physical terms, but, you know, your soul is going to live forever, and you're going to stand before God one day, and the only thing, the only thing that's going to matter is whether or not you were born again, whether you were adopted into his family. And the way you do that is by giving your heart to Christ, believing in what he did for you on the cross, repenting of your sins. And right now you can do that. If you need someone to pray with you about that or talk with you about that, I want you to come forward in a minute, and somebody will. But right now where you're seated, as you mull through it in your mind, 
There's nothing that would give us more joy. There's nothing that would give the angels in heaven more joy than for you to repent, to give your heart to Christ. So in the quietness of this moment, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. You do not have to say it out loud with out loud words, but in your heart, you should scream it with all you've got to Jesus. In your heart, give your heart to him. So here it is. Pray something like this. God, I need you in my life. Pray in your heart. God, I need you in my life. I cannot do this alone. I cannot do this on my own. Lord Jesus, would you come in and save me now? I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the grave. That's the good news, folks. Jesus died for you and he rose from the grave. He did it to save your soul. Maybe you're one of the ones that he appointed for salvation on this day, 2,000 years later. If that's you, just invite Christ into your life. Would you please come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me? Would you please forgive me of my sins? I give my life to you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you just prayed and invited Christ in your life, that's the most important decision you could ever make. It's just the beginning. You need to come forward and request baptism. You need to find a good church to go to, read the Bible, find someone who can hold you accountable. There's a lot of things. It's just the beginning. But for this moment right now, I would like to give you an opportunity to make a very, very small gesture, a, a just a, a small testimony that, yes, I just gave my heart to Jesus by raising your hand. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Did you just give your heart to Christ? Raise your hand where I can see it. Fantastic, girls, I see you. Who else? Anybody else? I just gave my heart to Christ. You don't have to raise your hand again. If, if you gave your heart to Christ, raise your hand where I can see it. Anybody else? Oh, wonderful. Good for you. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? God, I pray that you'd move during our time of invitation. I pray that you would change us. As a church, help us to go further. Help us to give more and help us to never quit. For these ones that just prayed to receive Christ, Lord, I pray that you'd help them, walk with them, give them the courage to take a public stand for you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is our invitation. If you want to pray, if you have a burden on your heart, come and do that. If you need someone to pray with you, come forward. We'll do that. If you want to join our church or ask for baptism or anything like that, come forward now. If you just gave your heart to Christ or if you have questions about that, come forward and we'll talk to you about it. Let's stand and sing. Come as God leads you. What can take a dying man Raise him up to life What can fill the emptiness? What can mend the brokenness? Brokenness. Mighty.
Ah, wonderful song. It's the cross. That's what it's all about. And thank God for what he did on the cross for us to save our souls. And today, Tiffany and Cassie have come forward. They've experienced the power of the cross in their lives. They've given their hearts to Christ. They've been born again. So we're all happy for them. And uh, they've come and requested baptism this morning. So we'll do that soon. And um, I hope today that we will all walk out of here more motivated than ever. Yes, we have hurts. Yes, we have difficulties. Yes, we have heartaches. And nobody's, nobody's ignoring that. Those have to be addressed, too. We have to, we have to get through this life and live our lives and be healthy and all that. But at the end of the day, we have a whole community that needs Jesus. It's our job. It's our responsibility. God has commissioned us. It's our mission to connect them with Christ. I hope that you will get engaged in that. In your little, your little neighborhood, your little job, your little class, your, wherever it is you are. However it is that God wants you to get engaged in it, I hope that you will. We'll have our men's and women's Bible studies on Wednesday night. If you've never been to that, come. It's really, really good. The women are just getting started with theirs. The men are just finishing theirs. We have a bazillion children and teenagers all over the place on Wednesday night. It's really amazing the work God's doing. We had 106 in the youth at Collision on Wednesday night. Um, that's just a move of God.
there's a lot of opportunities there as far as crowd control and bus monitoring and all that. We could use your help, okay? So please do that and sign up for Operation Chesterfield. Get involved, and uh, let's pray for God to do something mighty, mighty through the power of his cross, not through our cute little clever um, giz, you know, gimmicks and all this other stuff. We are, we are going to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring revival to our, to our country, which desperately needs it, to our community, to our church. I hope that you are committed to that. The, the women have their trip this weekend. I don't think it's too late to get involved in that. The men, we have a trip next weekend with the Iron, iron Sharpens Iron. It's definitely not too late to get signed up and registered for that. I hope you will. God in heaven, take us home safely. Help us to take what we've learned to put it to action. Lord, help us to be more like um, Paul and Barnabas and, le and less like John Mark. Lord, help us to stand boldly for you, to be courageous and to never quit. Lord, I pray that you would heal the hurts. I pray that you would heal the broken bodies and heal the, the relationships and, and mend those, those relationships that are, that, are, that are struggling. Lord, I pray that you would take the one who's just downright depressed and going through difficulties that, that, that are just so overwhelming to them right now. Lord, I pray that they would understand that your cross is mighty even for them. And you have the solutions, much more than a pill, much more than a, some doctor or some expert. Lord, they need you first and foremost. We need you first and foremost. We love you. We thank you for um, Tiffany and, and Cassie today coming forward and, and requesting baptism. We thank you for the work that you're doing in their lives and in so many other lives here. We praise you for that. That's what it's all about. We're so thankful that you are alive and moving in our church. Bless us as we leave. Use us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.